Hi, everyone. Um, my name, uh, thank you for joining us today for the Public Art in the Age of COVID-19 uh, webinar. My name is Lucas Cowan, and I'm the Director and Curator of Public Art for the Rose Kennedy Greenway Conservancy. Uh, today's presentation and conversation is being broadcast on Zoom as well as YouTube, and will be recorded and made available afterwards for those that may, may not be able to join us today. Uh, before we kind of start, and I do uh, some other int introductions, we'd like to get, really get a quick sense of who is in the room with us today, uh, virtually. So if you are joining us through Zoom, um, you will soon see a poll pop up on your screen. Uh, if you wouldn't mind taking a moment to choose the main reason you are tuning in today, um, the question is prompting you what best describes your role in the arts, uh, whether you're an arts administrator, an artist, hopefully a Greenway Public Art fan or other, uh, it'd be wonderful just to see who's in the room with us. So if you could just take a moment to click uh, that and uh, submit it, uh, it'd be wonderful. Um, and while you're doing that, um, we will be leaving time at the end for the Q&A uh, portion of this. Uh, if you by chance submitted a question ahead of time, uh, thank you, uh, we'll work to address those. And if you would like to submit a question now, um, we'd love to hear from you too. You can use the Q&A function on your menu to type in your questions. Um, but before we kind of get started, what I wanted to, to, give, uh, to do is because I know some of you are not familiar with the Greenway or maybe joining us from other parts of the country. Um, uh, I'd like to uh, briefly orient you to the Rose Kennedy Greenway Conservancy. Um, the Greenway is actually a mile and a half park, public park that runs between Chinatown and the North End in downtown Boston. The reason that the park is linear and right downtown is that it used to be here uh, in the location where the elevated highway was, the central artery is, was, excuse me, uh, as you saw in our before picture. And as part of the Big Dig project, a tunnel was built underground for the highway. And so uh, here's the after picture showing what the Greenway space looks like today. As you can see, it's a very vibrant and green uh, park system that actually goes directly through the city as well as it butts up against the waterfront. Uh, so there's a lot of amazing access points um, uh, from the city. Uh, we go through five separate uh, communities, um, as I said, starting in Chinatown to the Financial District, to uh, Fort Point Channel area, the Wharf District, and uh, the North End, and bookend both by Chinatown and uh, 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 the North End, which are two of the most historic areas in downtown Boston. Uh, the Greenway opened in 2008 as the Big Dig was wrapping up and sits atop I-93, uh, which is below ground. Um, although downtown is currently pretty subdued, obviously due to COVID-19, uh, the Greenway is typically full of activity. Um, in normal years, we're offering over 400 free uh, events annually. We have a custom uh, carousel. Uh, we were the first organization to present food trucks and the first beer garden in, the, in downtown Boston, as well as providing lush and organic green spaces throughout. Uh, in 2012, we started the Contemporary Public Art Program uh, on the Greenway, and we have a myriad of water features that you can uh, run through uh, and enjoy during the summer months. It's really an amazing place, and you can learn so much more about on our website if you'd like to learn more. Uh, I work for the Greenway Conservancy, which is actually the nonprofit organization responsible for the management and care of the Greenway. And since this model is a little unusual in Massachusetts and probably also within um, the United States, I'll just point out that we are uh, on state land, uh, which is leased out to our nonprofit by MassDOT, and we have total operating control. So our nonprofit has a full horticultural and maintenance staff, in addition to a program staff, a public art staff, development and administration staff. And I think collectively at the Greenway, we envision a vibrant, inclusive and involving and excuse me, and evolving uh, gathering place that ultimately raises the standards of excellence for urban park management. The Greenway's public art, or the Conservancy's public art program was actually initially formed in 2012 and began implementation in 2014 with a focus on contemporary and temporary exhibitions of public art that facilitate um, both artistic experimentation and speaks to our current moments. Uh, and what a current moment we are in today, right? Um, I can't believe it, where we're at right now. But uh, today I'm joined by three members of our Greenway Public Art Advisory Group. The Greenway Public Art Advisory Group, or GPAG as we internally call it, uh, provides myself and the Executive Director, Jesse Brackenberry, with guidance and counsel, counsel on strategies, best practices, public art planning, 
um, and, and plans by reviewing, discussing, and evaluating curated projects on the Greenway. They're also a fantastic group um, that brings together a lot of ideas um, uh, to help um, increase awareness, to help with uh, programming around these artworks, and to also just have really candid conversations about public art in New England and in Boston. So thank you so much. In addition to our three panelists from GPAD who I'll introduce shortly, um, I wanted to showcase some of the other members of our group that includes Sylvia Lopez Chavez, who is both an artist and graphic designer. You'll see many of her murals around downtown Boston. Uh, John Shea, who is the information, uh, Chief Information Officer for Eaton Vance and is a member of our Greenway Board. He should, serves as a vice chair. Sarah Montrose, who is the curator uh, at the Cordoba Sculpture Park and Museum through the trustees of the reservation. Cynthia Wu, director of the Pow Arts Center at the Boston China Chinatown uh, Neighborhood Center. Rick Rendell, who is the technology and innovation strategist and senior director at Autodesk. And Karen Pfefferly, who is an art curator and manager of philanthropy at Wellington Management Company, uh, and is also a, uh, a butter to the Greenway itself. So thank you so much to all of them for being part of this uh, evolving group um, that gives so much information and conversation um, and advice to myself and the Greenway. So I'm going to move into actually the introduction of our speakers today who will be joining us. Uh, we'll be joined by Cara Elliott Ortega, who is the Chief of Arts and Culture at the City of Boston. Cara focuses on cultural, orga uh, cultural organizing and intersection of arts and culture with community development. Uh, prior to becoming the Chief of Arts and Culture a few years ago, she served as the uh, Director of Policy and Planning for the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture. Our second uh, panelist is Che Anderson. Uh, che is the Deputy Cultural Development Officer uh, for the City of Worcester. And Che is also the founding director of the Pow Wow uh, Worcester Mural Festival. And finally, uh, I'm, I'm happy to welcome Dr. Leonie Bradbury, who is the Foster Chair, Distinguished Curator in Residence at Emerson College School of the Arts. Leone teaches in the Department of Visual and Media Arts at Emerson, in addition to curating and directing the Media Art Gallery administering the Hewitt and Spectre Gallery and serving on the School of the Arts Public Art Think Tank. Um, so thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we're gonna actually transition into our panel discussion now. Welcome everybody, thanks for joining us. Um, uh, we've structured our discussion and uh, reflections around the beginning of the pandemic um, and through this presentation and looking forward to the future. Uh, some of my questions will be directed directly to our spe to individual speakers, um, and some will be based on all of them uh, as we work through the planning of this uh, program today. So, if you would like to submit a question as we're going through these present this presentation, um, you can do that now or any time throughout the webinar. You can use the Q and A button at the bottom of your screen to do so. Uh, and we'll have time at the end of this to answer your questions at the end of the webinar. So thank you so much. So we're gonna jump into it, everyone. Um, I kind of really wanted to start off with some initial reactions to COVID-19 when this uh, kind of really hit Boston, I think back in uh, early March, right? I think it was around March 12th um, that things really started to happen in Boston. Um, you know, that was around the same time that I think a lot of museums decided to also close um, or, or projects were stalled. And I think all of us were kind of scrambling to figure out what next steps would be in kind of presenting this work or how we were going to present this work moving forward through COVID, right? And I think one of the things that also came along with COVID was this immediate sense of isolation. You know, a lot of us really moved uh, organizationally from working indoors um, to our home, our home offices, right? So we even become kind of secluded a little bit from our colleagues as well as the artists that we've all been working with, right? So kind of just to kind of go back in history a little bit uh, this past year, you know, uh, what were some of the biggest challenges that you all faced within the organization, um, in your individual organizations, I should say, in regards to your public art programming or your arts programming in general? Um, you know, maybe Kara, we'll start off with you a little bit, um, just from a city standpoint, kind of how you guys grappled with those, those initial issues. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, it was such a, a fast moving time, just those first couple of weeks even. And it's, it's hard to think about challenges to our programs without just thinking about what it was like to be a city arts office in that moment, um, because everything just you know, flipped. It was everyone we worked with, individual artists, cultural workers, creative workers, organizations, it, 
either were out of work entirely or closed. And so I think like right then and there, um, it was it was clear that this was going to be something where we had to go look at what we normally do and throw that all out the window and just figure out how to be responsive right there in the moment. Um, so we you know, took all of the funding that we normally have through kind of nicely packaged grant programs and other kinds of commissions and things. And we um, turned that into an artist relief fund. First thing that we did, um, I think even in that first week, and we might've had the first artist relief fund in the country actually. Um, and I think, you know, specific projects may have been paused, but it just like was not at the top of the list. You know, I think if you'd asked me in that moment, what's going on with public art, it would have just not even made the the cut of what we were talking about at that moment. Um, and even, and since then, you know, our whole function as a municipal arts office has continued to evolve, but distributing COVID support, being a connection point for people and for organizations who aren't sure what they can do or where they need to go for resources, um, thinking about the impact of COVID across the sector. I mean, like you mentioned museums closing, like immediately that starts a whole other conversation around like what's the impact to the economy for the entire summer, right? And the role of, the, of arts and culture in supporting that. Um, thinking about interdependencies with other areas, like yes, economic development, but also education, creative youth development. Um, and so there's just this cascading like realization of everything that was gonna be impacted. Um, and you know, on top of that, the, the fun job of trying to interpret state guidelines <laughs> around COVID and how we can actually keep trying to do this work and the restrictions that we have. So that's been, you know, that's been life for the last eight months. But I do, I do take some pride in how the office was able to um, immediately say, okay, this is what's happening. We're gonna change how we spend our money and what we're prioritizing and just figure out how to provide some financial relief right away. Yeah, I mean, I think that's one of, I mean, the, the state and, and even city guidelines, right? Even initial construction bans that happened, not only, you know, with public art projects even, but even just in redevelopment projects that were put on hold. Um, we know at the Greenway ourselves, you know, a lot of the programs that we were starting to, uh, public art projects that we were starting to build were put on hold because of those construction bans at the same time for the safety of not only trying to figure out how to ship things, whether internationally or nationally, safely, um, but also how to install those with groups of teams that needed to be there, right? Shay, you come also from, you know, a city standpoint as well too in Worcester, as well as, you know, the festival itself. Were there any specific reactions that you guys had or was it similar to, to Carr's experience? So I would say it was extremely similar to Carl's experience. I think most municipalities had a very similar response. Um, one of the things that happened in Worcester um, was there was the development and inception of this idea called Worcester Together, where a lot of the nonprofit leads and heads as well as municipal leaders got together to figure out how to address some of the acute needs we had in the community. And so we talked food security, we talked elder care, we talked child care. Uh, we tried to figure out housing um, with some of the evictions we thought were going to be forthcoming. Um, and that expanded to become at one point 11 different sub organizations. And so uh, myself and Aaron Williams, the city's culture director, were actually assigned to work with that organization. And so you had all of you know, talking about, you know, developing a, a food program to ensure that, you know, single parents that may have been inflicted with COVID had food for their children had hot meals, figuring out with our housing office what we can do in order to mobilize new legislation and, you know, lobby for the governor to ensure that people were still safe and sound. Um, and so I think similar to Cara, public art was still present, but was a thing that we were like, we can get to at some point. Um, and, and we have, you know, currently 13 different public art projects that we were having bids open for. And we had to have a very real conversation because as a community, people were hurting and potentially losing their housing or their work. And so it's hard to put out an RFP for a $200,000 sculpture when people may not be able to pay rent. Um, and so we had to have that sort of um, very serious internal conversation. But, um, you know, here we are sort of nine months later. Uh, and, and I think that, you know, we had a team that was amazing um, at reacting and ensuring that, you know, we can do what we can for our cultural a cultural uh, organizations, both large and small. We also instituted an art of relief uh, fund. So thank you, Boston, for doing that because that was a great idea and initiative. And um, we were happy to help many of the artists here um, amongst a multitude of projects that we tried to keep arts and culture at the forefront of conversation because um, you know, a lot of the uh, sort of levity and just sanctity that was added for people who were at home came from the artist community. And we wanted to ensure that people were aware of that as part of the you know, campaign moving forward. So how do we explain that you know, the reason you're able to sit home and watch whatever show on Netflix you want is because of the art community. The reason you're able to watch this live stream for a musician is because of the art community. Um, and that was a really big part of sort of the early days of our response. Yeah, I mean, you bring up good points too. I mean, in regards to, you know, food equity at the same time, you know, you think also in Boston how 
um, you know, the watershed, which is, you know, through the ICA, which is uh, essentially an open and free public space, usually for public art or arts uh, programming uh, for the community, how they've also pivoted as well too, right, to as a food distribution site, right? And so how we use our public spaces to help it advance and, and bring forth public amenities that are needed, you know, very, very needed right now, right? And I mean, uh, Leone, you are in an education environment, right? It, I'm sure education, as most parents and most families and students know, has changed considerably through online learning, right? You know, and and in working in studio practices and also running a gallery, um, and and showcasing artists in galleries that are sometimes immersive installations, specifically, right? How how did you guys initially react to that at Emerson and and kind of pivot? Yeah. Well, I think obviously it's a very different scale than kind of um, Cara and Che's experience thinking citywide. I mean, we were primarily focused on our campus and our kind of immediate community and um, all of our classes went online. And I think you just mentioned what is my least favorite word of 2020 is pivot because that was like the key word at the time. Like we were all pivoting all over the place and it just felt like on the one hand, we were moving things virtually, both our classes and our exhibitions, but at the same time, too, we're, we're starting to think or rethink our, our public, our, our, our art spaces because our interior spaces were closing. So how could we continue to um, both honor the commitments that we already had to artists that we wanted to work with and also to artists um, as a whole to continue to provide opportunities for exhibition and new commissions. And, you know, myself and the Dean of the School of the Arts, we made a commitment to continue to do that and to not shut down that budget and to continue to invest at whatever scale we could manage and considering all the circumstances to continue to showcase art. And, you know, even if that meant that now we were doing it on the windows of the gallery or on the exterior face of a building, rather than inside. So it definitely was a, a period of both kind of going virtual as well as um, rethinking our, our spaces and a commitment to um, continue to support the artist community. And I think that's interesting because I do think that, you know, in this, in a lot of ways, looking nationally even, and even within Boston, right? Looking at ways that administrators and curators have used, you know, infrastructure right that exists you said the the walls the the, the windows um you know public spaces and in presenting works that would normally be behind you know uh, a walkable in indoor uh, environment right and how artists are also working to address you know and change that maybe their practices a little bit in showcasing the work but still getting their artistic messaging across i think you know in regards to the greenway itself and our public art programming you know at those very onset you know, we were ready to go with a massive slate of artists. We were, we were in the midst of shipping and lining up our installers and we were still able to present maybe a smaller pared down version uh, of what this season was going to be about, which I think was also extremely, in particularly, um, you know, prevalent in, in the discussion globally in regards to immigration and politics, um, and colonialism, et cetera, all of the, some of the social issues that were being dealt with at the same time at, uh, uh, for this year prior to the pandemic and still continues through. Um, but we were faced heavily with those challenges, uh, as I mentioned before, with shipping and, and installation aspects. Um, but I think the one thing that we can also be proud about within public art is that when those museums are closing down or those galleries were closing down, you know, public art spaces and, and free public art was there for people when they needed it most even, right? Even just to get out of their house for five minutes. And what public art can bring to a community or especially during a pandemic is sometimes a little bit of respite, right? Or imagination that um, is sometimes we're so siloed in um, during these times. So it was a very challenging time. And I think, you know, looking at those budgets and making sure that we're still paying the artists and we're still paying for work to be installed um, and still showcasing those ideas is more prevalent than ever, I think. You know, I mean, we look at the fact that the ICS will just closed down, what, on December 8th as well, too, again, because of the uh, the guidelines that were put in place. So, you know, public art is there um, for when you need it. Um, and so I'm so happy as part of the Greenwood to be able to still present that, that type of work. Um, you know, I mean, th this kind of goes now past into kind of these ideas of adaptation to COVID-19, you know, I think, you know, kind of what we're doing today, we're all online, right? We're all have moved to a lot of online programming discussions and conversations. And, you know, I think we're so reliant a little bit now on 
social media as well as webinars and Zooms, et cetera, to kind of still create relevance um, within the programming and pushing the ideas of artists out um, to, to the peoples. Um, you know, I think when in the early days, we also kind of pivoted, I, actually I'm gonna stop saying that word pivot because you are right, it is one of my least favorite words. Uh, <laughs> Uh, in the early days, we also had to come up with new structures and ways in which to allow the public to engage with works that maybe not be able to visit because of transportation or fear of leaving the house at the same time, right? And so when we did the Bring the Greenway Home campaign, you know, that originally started off with like coloring pages and interactive kind of things uh, for people to do at home with their kids at the same time, we really looked at our one of our main programs, which uh, was still up, which is around augmented reality, right? And releasing the augmented reality from, you know, just globally based on the Greenway to globally and experience anywhere, right? And so, you know, augmented reality was one of those big things, I think, early on, too, that everyone was like, well, how can we how can we work with artists to do augmented based works, essentially, right? And, you know, in those early days, I think artists themselves were struggling with the fact that they had exhibitions that were either canceled or put on hold at the same time and how they themselves were going to feel maybe relevant as well, too. And um, in, in this pandemic that maybe they weren't working virtually. Right. And so. You know, I guess the second question to you all is thinking about those early days, you know, how do artists create amid such destruction, right? Amid such a pandemic, right? Where maybe some of their work isn't socially based, but it's more about beauty and fun and, and, and how to still make that feel relevant. Um, so, you know, how do, how do we connect with audiences that are in complete isolation, right? And whether that's through our public art program that people are feeling more comfortable to come out into atmospheres or, or public buildings, um, even on say time release tickets in museums even. Um, but how do you connect with audiences that are in complete isolation? I think there's new studies that are coming out um, uh, that I was just reading today about uh, mayors across the United States that feel that, you know, 40% of the population may not come back fully, right? Um, and so, you know, what do we make of these times and, you know, not to mention all of this time that we have? Um, maybe Che, we'll start with you. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm sure you folks have heard this at this point ad nauseum, but I, that, I, that Toni Morrison quote, I think that's been portrayed throughout the year is so spot on that in times of dread, like there's no time for despair, um, you know, exactly when artists go to work. And I think that that's never held more true than this year. Um, you know, I, in Worcester in particular, you know, the, the cultural office and the cultural coalition mobilized an arts at home program. So trying to figure out what was already recorded or what could be recorded to get performances from local artists and support them. Um, you know, the city of Worcester has two poet laureates, a, a poet laureate, a youth poet laureate. And so finding, you know, poetry programming to be done online so that the, the poetry community can speak to the times um, and maybe put some people at ease or be able to, to sort of speak truth to the situation that other folks are going through uh, who can't find the words themselves. Um, the, the city launched two sort of public art initiatives that I thought were, were really fun and really amazing. One, um, and, and I think they both relate to the fact that a lot of people early on kept saying, well, the world has stopped. And, and no, that's not true. The world did not stop. Things kept going. Uh, a, lot, a lot of people just couldn't go out and have some of the fun that they were having prior or engage in the same sort of way. But work kept flowing. Bills were still due. Um, a social anxiety was still building. And so one thing that we did was we launched a project called Give Me a Sign, where uh, we worked with 19 artists because COVID-19 um, and put out a call. And uh, artists designed 18 by 24, uh, effectively signs that look like municipal street signs, your normal no parking signs or um, you know, a person crossing signs. And they were things to get people uplift or speak to the current times. Um, at one point it was strictly about COVID-19. And as the summer went, uh, we opened it up to allow for artists to speak to what was happening around the Black Lives Matter movement. And a hundred plus signs were placed around the community to literally give people a sense of uplift. Some of them were just, positive sayings, some of them were just really fun and goofy things, some were a bit more serious, like call your loved ones, but they were just these constant reminders that people weren't alone for those that literally needed a sign. Uh, and the second was as we were heading toward the election, we thought, one, we, we want to encourage more people to vote, but two, you get the same I voted sticker that everyone else gets. And so a call was put out and artists were able to design these really interesting voting stickers, which, you know, I, I believe was New Yorker did with some of like the world's biggest artists. So that was, we were like, whoa, all right, way to... Way to flex. Um, but we had some amazing local artists that did them as well. And for us, it was an opportunity to not only um, encourage some of our local arts community, but also to find ways to get money in their pocket and to impact them and to get folks to know that there's still ways to engage the arts community 
through every facet of life. And so those are two things that I think, uh, not to use the term that Leone hates, but we were able to maneuver around or about um, and still find ways to put art in front of some people in the community. We can still say the word pivot. It's still functional. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know it kind of uh, falls under that that uh, uh, the term back in 2012 of creative placemaking, right? How it should be creative, you know, keep uh, uh, what is it? Creative um, place keeping, right? And so we're constantly re-evolving those those terminologies at the same time. Um, Leonie, how would you kind of address some of these these thoughts? Well, I mean, I, I guess I have two two thoughts in response to to your question, and and one is that I've ever since March I've been trying to think and pay attention to um, maybe what can we keep from this particular time, like what are some new ways that we're inventing, whether it's um, art presentation or connecting with our audiences, or you know there are some kind of um, innovative solutions that we've come up with as part of this process in response to this, this time of crisis. And I've been trying to pay attention to that and I don't necessarily have, have the answers, but I'm trying to um, kind of keep track and, and think of, you know, for example, you mentioned earlier, Lucas, not um, when we were preparing for this talk that now suddenly your audience is national for these webinars versus having a local audience for a public program. And we've experienced that as well. And that's something that, you know, I would hate to lose after we go back to quote unquote normal, like how could we, um, you know, maybe keep doing some online programming because it allows us to have a broader audience. And then the other thing that I wanted to um, just mention as an example of resiliency and also of creative problem solving was the project area code that I was a part of um, this summer, which was a um, an online art fair. And it was really started by a series or a group of, of curators and gallerists who were all um, dealing with lost revenue, with postponed and canceled exhibitions, with shut down spaces. We were all just kind of looking around at each other saying like, what can we do? Like, how can we pool our resources and um, put them back out in the community and create opportunity for the arts community that we so love and miss? And um, yeah, we created an online art fair. But in conjunction with that, we also felt, and this was the summer, this was August, we felt that it was important to um, explore safe ways of, of engaging with artwork because we were all so missing that. So we created a series of art installations that were based in window spaces, storefront spaces throughout Boston. And we organized some fun bike tours to go see these art spaces. And then I myself worked um, as a juror on and also an organizer of a digital art drive-in. So we used a drive-in movie theater setup, a pop-up in Salem, Mass, and we showcased the work of over 32 digital artists. And this is something that we wouldn't have done if we hadn't been under these, um, you know, particular circumstances, but it's something that I would love to do it again next summer, you know, COVID or no COVID, even if we're all, you know, immunized or have herd immunity, let's still have digital art drive-ins. It was just such an amazing experience and I'd like to, um, yeah, keep it <laughs> or do it again. Yeah, I think that's even more prevalent in the fact that Warner Brothers is now releasing all of their uh, movie theater movies on HBO, right? And that idea and that loss of that nostalgia of going to a movie theater may be lost even, right? And so how to keep uh, continuing that aspect um, with even the digital arts and the, the, the um, contemporary nature of artists that are creating around, you know, I think that's a wonderful idea. And 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 Kara, you know, I mean, one of the things that I think maybe I want to point point direct to you is we had talked before about this idea of the importance of um, R&D within the artist process um, and how, you know, at times of crisis like this, where we're all kind of slowing down and reevaluating, having a moment to think about, you know, what R&D means in studio practice. Do you want to maybe just talk a little bit about that? Because I think you had mentioned to before in a conversation about something the city was doing with R&D. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the decision to um, fund artists around this idea of R&D, and I think it's it's a little bit of a tongue-in-cheek R&D because it might really be that, but it could also just be actually like processing and sitting with everything that's going on and what that means for, for your work. Um, but I think it goes back to um, what Che was saying about the amount of work that artists were producing, right? Like artists were immediately creating tons of work 
um, online, not making any money doing so for the most part, but providing shows, conversations, spaces for reflection, you know, dance parties, ways for people to kind of release energy and connect. And so I think, um, and also actually like a lot of really interesting live archiving and documentation, especially around BLM and the demands for racial justice. So I think what we saw as our role was supporting the artists in how they're responding to their communities and, and to what they want to do with their practice in the moment. Um, and so we changed our support for temporary art over the summer to focus on different media, digital work, supporting conversations um, about wellness and healing and trauma, um, projects that use different kinds of engagement methods, um, including some which was online and um, involved kind of like what we might think of as an R&D kind of moment of how do I take advantage of a new technology or shift my practice to a digital platform. But some of it was also like going back in time and thinking about how do we use just, you know, uh, signage or um, snail mail or some of these other ways to kind of maintain connection. So I think that that was um, really helpful in terms of broadening our intention around what we meant by public art and prioritizing things that weren't just objects, because it really was based on this idea of how do we maintain kind of like ritual and connection and um, those things that we're missing so much right now. But uh, yeah, part of that was saying you can also apply for this funding to just sit in it <laughs> and just see what what's going on and what this feels like and to have conversations or to test, um, you know, new platforms and just to support people and kind of being, being um, particularly knowing just how many creative workers were out of work um, and still just like giving their all uh, to, to be responsive and to interpret what's happening and provide space to process it. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I think even going kind of like a, at a more national level in regards to that idea of how artists are also supporting artists, right? I mean, even through kind of like the social media campaign that um, Matthew Burroughs created, the Artist Support Pledge, where artists were selling work for like under $200 and every time they reached $1,000 worth of sales, they would purchase another artists work as well too. And so it's passing that buck and raising funds at the same time. So, I mean, I think it, it goes with that saying, you know, we always look for artists to solve problems that artists are also solving problems, you know, th themselves within their own community of artists. And I think that's just so wonderful and such a wonderful example of, of support that um, the artistic community does for each other is that they do rally around each other, right? Um, sometimes we're so siloed, I think maybe in our studio practice or what have you, or even our administration practice, but to, to really bring that cohort together, I think even, and, and, and as arts administrators, all of us have been part of, I don't know how many larger cohorts, right? Across Boston or across New England to really come together as organizations that we normally wouldn't have in the past to really talk about and share issues that we're all dealing with and problem solve in very different ways, right? And that cross resource share is so important, I think, to also making sure that our uh, communities and environments and our, our programs, you know, continue to exist. Um, even through maybe uh, partnerships that we wouldn't imagine uh, in the future. And, you know, I mean, maybe this goes, I want to pivot also too, um, back to, to, to Che. You know, Che, we, we had talked in a, a previous conversation and you brought up something that I think is such a wonderful um, loss um, that I, I would like to expand a little bit more on. And that is that loss of what you call the festival environment, right? And, you know, I think that whether it's a festival or whether it's an outdoor program or a public program or even, you know, a public art festival, whatever it may be, that feeling of being surrounded by so many people enjoying and conversating in this, this specific work, these ideas of artists, you know, can you speak a little bit more about this and how you see us moving forward to recapture this feeling? Yeah, I, I think that one of the things um, that's been the greatest loss during all of this and, and you know, not having any knock on any economics around it, but that, that feeling of, of, of community, I think really truly is the biggest loss this entire, uh, of all the proceedings of 2020. Um, and that goes beyond COVID. I'm talking of everything that's happened this year. I think that, that loss of camaraderie, that loss of togetherness. Um, and so I think about what festivals provide beyond sort of the art that's involved in them, right? A, a, a music festival, yes, th there's the music that's there. There tends to be the vendors that are there some of the, the sort of visual artists that are part of it, but it's that communal feeling of coming together, right? We've all been at music festivals or concerts. People can't sing, right? Like we, we know the songs, uh, we belt them out together, but it's that sort of communal feeling of singing your favorite song with 
a thousand other people who are horrible at singing and barely know the lyrics that really like uplift you in a different kind of way. Um, and so I think about public art festivals, mural festivals, um, some of the sculpture festivals that happen around the Commonwealth and just that feeling of walking through them and having a day with your friends and family, right? The ability to walk up to a piece of art and talk to a stranger about how you interpret it or talk to the artists themselves about why they developed it. Um, that's been one of the biggest losses. And so I think that moving forward, that's also one of the things that people are clamoring for the most, right? I think people are chomping at the bit at some point when it's safe to get outside because they really wanna re-engage people in that kind of way. Um, and, and so it, it's strange in that I think there's an inherent fear from people right now because I don't think people wanna get sick and there's sort of that, that off-puttingness, but I think that's where the arts come in, right? The arts are that glue that can bring people together that will bind people together. And so whether it's, it's music, dance, poetry, visual art, I think that as soon as it's safe to do so, there'll be no question of people getting together to, to re-engage with it, um, Worcester included for whether it's powwow or are in the park, or, you know, we have a big street festival called Star in the Street that brings like 50,000 people over the course of a day to a part of Worcester to well, buy things from our crafters and artisans. And that's been a missed opportunity this year, not just for the organizers, but for the crafters themselves who haven't necessarily had the platform to increase their sales this year. So I, you know, I, I hope that I'm right. Um, but I think that people are gonna jump right back at that as soon as we can. Yeah, I mean, I think I'd have to fully agree. I mean, we, you know, one of the larger exhibitions that actually just came down this year was based in Shin Park in Chinatown. Um, that was by the artist, local artist Yuan Wu called Lantern Stories, right? Uh, we started that commission over almost two years ago um, that was also really meant to help celebrate the festivals that exist within Chinatown, right? And was meant to be up for, you know, a series of four months that, you know, was about the history, the past, the present, right? Um, and to be a canopy to gather under as part of these larger festivals that were taking part around you. And I think one of the things when we were going through a lot of the conversations of should this or should this not happen because the festivals were not happening, you know, we made the specific decision to say, you know what, even without those festivals, the idea that people can still come and gather, the people that can still come and see themselves reflected in this work um, or tells the history and, and really makes them think about the future was really important. And I have to say, you know, out of um, a lot of the works that we've done on the Greenway over the past couple of years, we didn't have, I, I think it had the most community support and the most community outpouring and cry for, for, for thanking, you know, not that we were there for thanking by any means, um, but, you know, more specifically thanking the artists for actually making it come to reality. And I think even with that project, the original you know, description when we did the community process in selecting that artist was really different from the outcome of what it became. And I think, you know, this is something that maybe we'll pivot a little bit more into in this next section is this idea of, you know, we can't be remiss without talking about the politics, the, the racism, the social issues that we're also all dealing with uh, in every city right now, right? And, you know, what Yuen Wu was able to do so wonderfully with Lantern Stories was really, you know, also show representation of resiliency within the Chinatown communities of the fights and the struggles or even the xenophobia that was happening politically within, with the coronavirus, right? And um, to show the strongness of community. And so, you know, before we move on to that, I just wanted to just double check to make sure nobody had anything in response to that festival environment um, that they wanted to, to raise. Um, but if not, I, I, you know, maybe I'll pivot into, you know, it's been a hard year, right? Uh, our, you know, and this even goes back to this idea of artists creating, you know, in live time, right? Or pop up protest work, right? At the same time, which is still in public space in a lot of ways, right? Um, you know, without talking about social and political divides that are so rock that have so rocked the country, uh, in particular, as we, we all reckon with racism, you know, in the public art world, we saw uh, both new or adapted works around Black Lives Matter movement. And we also saw a lot of discussion and controversy around monuments and statues, right? Permanent public art. Um, knowing that you all intersect with this in different ways, obviously, you know, I'd like to hear from each of the panelists on the themes and how they connect within, you know, the work that they're doing. Um, che, I know that you also, uh, the Black Lives Mural in Worcester came, came about. Uh, Cara, you know, the, the Boston Arts Commission has been working with the community and struggling around these ideas of the Christopher, Christopher Columbus Monument Memorial, as well as um, 
uh, the Emancipation Memorial. And Leone, I'd love to hear from him over here in a more academic standpoint, kind of, you know, how this plays into some of the work that you're doing and working with in, in student work, right? Um, so maybe Che, or if you want to start, or actually maybe Cara, let's start with you. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's such a huge topic. It's like, you know, where where to begin? And I can say a little bit about Emancipation um, Group Memorial and some of what's coming up there, although part of me feels like, you know, what, what we do with some of those memorials and monuments is such a small sliver of the conversation. And um, we just announced last week a, a program that's been like two years in the making now called Radical Imagination for Racial Justice um, that supports artists of color, practicing, testing ideas of what racial justice looks like in and with their communities. And I think a lot of the things that we've been talking about in this conversation so far actually relate a lot to that work in the sense that um, those grants have a 20% a wellness um, budget item. Like you actually have to spend that on yourself, whatever that means to you for your well-being. And I think like part of what we're talking about on this call is that like the, this work doesn't just happen and it's not magic and you can't just like come back and turn on the lights and have all the nice things that you want to enjoy. Like Che was saying, like, you're not going to just be able to, you know, turn on Netflix and see things, right? Like there's actual work and care that goes into all of this. And I think um, because we do so much work with individual artists, that's, that is one of the, I think one of the, the things that we'll take away from this whole time period, which is thinking about the wellness of people and how people actually sustain themselves in this work, especially, you know, for a city like Boston, artists of color who, you know, we started that radical imagination for racial justice program way before COVID and this reality that like the crises of poverty and racism and all of these things are ongoing. So what does it mean to actually make sure that people can sustain themselves and thrive and do this work and that it's not just something that sort of happens. And I feel like it's also related to how we're thinking about the economic impact of everything. There's just kind of this, like we take creative work for granted and think it's just gonna be there. Um, but on the, the memorials and monuments side of things, um, you know, it's been really interesting. Emancipation Group Memorial, and maybe I can add a link to the chat for people who want to know more. Um, but we got hundreds of people involved in responding to, um, to that artwork, calls for its removal, some people calling for it to stay, um, different kind of takes on every aspect of it, the history of the work, the representation in the work. Uh, and at the end of all of that, um, you know, our commission did vote to remove it. Um, and that the logistics of that are something that we're figuring out now. But I think that the public conversation was in some ways as important as the actual kind of action to remove the piece, because we do really need the time and space to actually hear from each other, like hear where people feel welcome and why or why not, like the nuances of how public representation affects people, um, including like viscerally, emotionally, um, and beyond just the conversation, even about representation and how much of our own public art memorializes um, white men in bronze, especially in Boston. There's this bigger question about what it means to memorialize individuals at all in the first place and kind of what's missing in our larger public cultural symbols and the landscape of that and what that means about our relationship to time and space even. I mean, these are huge questions, but um, it's this, I think what, what we're talking about now when we're trying to sit in the complexity of is this deeply problematic idea of having something etched in stone forever as its own kind of colonization, both of physical space, but also in establishing a dominant narrative and how that how that's something that then we have to live and reckon with. So super complex mega topics, but <laughs> I think um, part of the challenge from a city kind of bureaucratic standpoint is how we sit in that and keep having those conversations. And we'll be using the next year to um, focus on Emancipation Group and probably a couple of other key pieces in Boston as pilots for how we keep having that conversation and kind of be in all the complexities of it. And my hope is that we can really involve um, artists and residents and young people in, um, in that dialogue, but also in actually actively making and creating things in response to and as a part of what that conversation is. So it's not, you know, I think this this summer we've had a lot of talking heads and part of the question is like, how do we move past that to actually like practice what it means to do something different? And I think that that's it's hard to to start that. And what does that look like um, and how can we take some first steps? Amazing. I mean, thank you so much for the work that you do uh, in the city and, and the conversations that you're creating around that, because I know that 
you know, Boston is not unique in these conversations. They are everywhere uh, from the United States to overseas as well too. Um, and luckily, you know, we're not throwing statues into the, into the water yet, but uh, we're having thoughtful conversations about how to handle these and what actually even happens to them afterwards. So um, thank you. Um, Leonie, do you wanna maybe uh, talk a little bit? Sure, yeah. I think, you know, like, like Kara was saying, this is such a, these are such huge questions and we are all trying to, um, you know, grapple with and articulate the complexities of, of this particular moment. And one way that we participated or, or contributed was to organize um, two panel discussions on memorials. One was memorials as monuments fall and the other one was memorials markers of time as a question. And we brought together um, with two faculty um, at Emerson, um, Cher Knight and Anya Belkin. Um, we brought together um, two panels of, of scholars, artist activists, and architects and urban planners to kind of dig into those questions. And one of the things that you know we discovered, even though we had two 90 minute conversations um, with audience participation is, you know, we really barely scratched the surface, but it was such an important conversation to have. And it felt, um, I don't know, it felt urgent to be participating and also to create a platform for these conversations to be brought to the fore. And um, there's so much more to be, be said there, but I think, you know, academia can, can participate in that, um, especially in the sense of, of helping to contextualize um, this current moment, perhaps in, in, in the sense of that this is not just, I mean, obviously it's a unique moment, but there's also a sense of history and there are other things that we can look at at a broader scale. And in that sense, maybe, um, you know, academia can, can participate in this conversation as well in a unique way. Thank you. And Che, I mean, what is your response to that? I mean, it's, it's you know, we, we talk about your specialties also within murals, right, as well too, and how murals have always been there kind of at the, at the forefront of talking about social issues at the same time. Um, how, how do you address these within your community or your festivals? I think that one of the most important things this year that I think we've started to have a conversation um, about as, as a global community, but also as I think Americans and people of Massachusetts, is sort of the, the difference in the reckoning we're having between history and fact. And I think that for the longest time, those two words have been synonymous. And I think we've learned a lot this year that they're not, um, right? Um, the history that we have of, of Christopher Columbus or the Black Panther Party, or in 50 years, the history we'll have of presidencies, right? Aren't necessarily all shrouded in the fact of who they were or what they did or their actions or policies or procedures. Sometimes they're how they made you feel. Um, and I think that that's, part of the difficulty in having some of these conversations, right, is the idea of our familial history, our personal history versus history as is widely accepted in the facts around that. Um, and so when I think about public art, when I think about uh, murals in particular, um, one, I think most people on this panel know, um, and I've been very adamant about, I love murals because of how quick they can happen. I think they are a, a form of public art that you can respond immediately with um, and get your feelings out on a wall or into a street or wherever the case may be. Um, and I love that. I think that there aren't many um, pure forms of art in that way anymore where they can be unfettered, unfiltered. They're just whatever you think. And that's the you respond to it. Um, and so when I, when I started seeing Black Lives Matter murals go up around the country, um, I, I was like, oh man, all right, this is gonna be really interesting to see what happens here. Um, and in Worcester, what I can say is that I love the fact, I, I love the way that it came together because I feel as though it is a perfect example of how community can work hand in hand with government. Right. Um, it was community members wanting to make something happen. It was the arts community coming together and saying, okay, we have a vision for how we can create this. There were members of the uh, actual, like the, the education community who came together and did some of the measurements to figure out exactly how it could be laid out, working hand in hand with members of the municipal administration to figure out what streets it could be, how do you block the road, what needs to be put on the piece after it to ensure that it doesn't make the road too slick. Um, and then it was community coming together around the actual day, right? Providing food, providing water, providing paint supplies, providing Bluetooth speakers, because you can't paint a Black Lives Matter mural without doing the electric slide. Like things like that were, were important. And, and I, I've explained to people that I, I think that Worcester's mural, and I'm biased and I don't care, was one of the best ones, right? Because it wasn't just like a yellow mural. Each individual letter was done by an artist. And of the 16 letters, 13 of those artists had never done a mural before. So at the beginning of the day, there were three murals. At the end of the day, you had 16, which is amazing for us, the local community. 
But more important than the final product was that day, right? We're talking in the midst of July, in the midst of COVID, a community coming together and trying to social distance, wearing masks, painting in the heat, but also having a sense of community at a time where festivals and gatherings aren't allowed. Like that, it was a beautiful day. It's one of my favorite days of this year. Um, and so it's, it's also something that I, you can't capture in photos or video content. Like you had to be there to really get a feel for what it's like when an artist hands a roller to a, a six-year-old and she gets to put her hand into something that's seen as a historic moment during a historic time in our country. Um, and I think that that happened in so many communities around the country. And it happened in different ways where it wasn't just on the street, right? The George Floyd mural in Minneapolis, Minnesota is, is iconic at this point, in my opinion. Um, seeing uh, uh, Jairo Vega, who's, who's from you know, Massachusetts, walk around with Thomas Evans from Denver and do spray their name murals in different communities to highlight the different people who've been taken over the last decade plus was amazing. And that's iconic in my opinion. And I don't throw the word iconic around. So I, I, I am so proud of the public art community. And I'm, I'm hopeful that this isn't a flash in a pan, that this wasn't uh, a, a catalyzing event that got people really excited about discussing uh, systemic racism and, and systematic oppression. And then 2021 comes and we're like, great, that was last year's thing. I hope that people understand that this is a fight that's gonna continue and that people in our positions help provide a platform for people to continue that fight. No, amazing. Uh, thank you for that, Che. You know, I mean, I think going even back to that idea of you said handing a roller to a, a child, right, and being part of a moment. I think in this moment specifically, in regards to kind of a lot of the social based work that's happening, this idea that the public finds or feels a sense of urgency to get out, right, versus just talking about it on the phone or talking about it on on, on social media, but to get out and to physically do something, I think, is amazing. Um, and I think that also shows the power of public space, right? To, to use these spaces as ways to communicate specific issues. And I think another artist that I would just throw in there is Jamie Holmes, who used the airplane banners um, bearing Floyd's last words, um, was just amazing flying those over, right? Over, over cities. Um, so I know that I wanna be conscious of time because they're at 152. And I mean, we've, we've touched on a few topics and we could probably go on for like hours, obviously. Um, but uh, I want to leave some, just a few moments for questions. Um, we've had some questions come in and um, what I'd like to do is actually one of the questions, just to clarify, we were talking about R and D um, and what that means is research and development essentially within practice. Um, so that was just a question I wanted to just clarify right there. Um, but, you know, one of, I guess, you know, kind of, uh, there's so much that we talked about, but I guess one of the questions that came in is, you know, how do you think COVID-19 will impact the use and thinking around public space as opportunities for art moving forward, right? We touched a few on these, right? And Leone, you said, you know, I hope that the lessons we've learned are that they're not one-offs, right? At the same time that we can use this and move forward with it, say with the, the digital arts um, uh, uh, drive-ins, right? Are there other ways that anyone wants to respond to, to that question of how we think about public space moving forward in, in a different way that we've either had lessons learned or want to try moving forward? And I'm just, I think for myself, um, actually, I just lost my thought. Hold on, we'll come right back. <laughs> I mean, what, I think one thing, um, while Leonie remembers what she was gonna say, the, um, from like a, a city engagement perspective, I think this has been kind of an interesting time to refresh the idea of doing things physically where people are and live and, spend their time, um, you know, we're as a city had to move all of the city's public engagement um, to digital platforms for the most part. And I think learning some really amazing lessons about accessibility and reach by doing that, but also obviously thinking about like digital divide and who actually has access to any of this. Um, and I think that there's something interesting in, um, for me personally, at least in, in coming back to like analog on-site interventions and a little bit more of the fluidity of whether it's like murals or signage or public art, like between those things, both as a way to communicate with different publics, but also um, as artistic interventions in and of themselves. And I think, you know, it's not, there's nothing really new in any of that, but I think as we kind of understand, I think a little bit deeper what some of the issues were in city engagement, you know, have been, I guess I should say, 
um, and what's being revealed about some of that. I, I, kind, I hope that there's a way that we can kind of come back and double down on that um, kind of in-person intervention as a way of keeping people more connected. Um, so that's just something that I've been reflecting on even through some of the temporary art that we funded that again, it's not like any one of those things is doing something like radically different in and of itself, but that it's oriented around this idea of maintaining connection at a time of disconnection, I think is um, a helpful way for us to think about that moving forward. Leone? Yeah, I think I was just thinking along something along similar lines in terms of not taking things for granted that previously you just kind of taking for granted that you could have art in your life or that you could encounter art in public spaces. And now I just have a personally a very renewed appreciation of, of those things. And also what both um, Che and Kara have mentioned about connection and getting together with other people to enjoy art and how that is a very special part of our lives that we've been missing and have had to miss out on. And, you know, I, I appreciate that so much more now, and I can't wait to have those shared art experiences again, whether they're in public spaces or back in museums and galleries and, and back inside, but yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and I think, you know, one of the other things that I've been thinking about a lot, a lot lately too is because there has been such an onset of fantastic, you know, reactionary work, whether it be COVID or it be around social issues, there's also still this idea of beauty and fun needs to still exist within the public art field, that public art can still be a respite for you to come to and lose yourself for a moment from maybe the the constant barrage that we are being faced with socially every day at the same time. Um, uh, another question that came in is um, uh, from Fausto Fernandez, who said, how is the experience of working as an artist on public art projects out of state or internationally? Um, do they cover travel expenses for travel and with COVID has it affected hiring people out of state? Uh, I think I may just take this one and if anyone has anything they'd like to respond to too. Yeah, I would say uh, most definitely, um, I, I would say it's not only just COVID, but it's also certain um, political um, and legislative uh, from the federal level initiatives that aren't allowing certain uh, members of, of artists or uh, peoples into certain areas of the country. Um, when we worked with Mehdi Gandayanlu on the Greenway in 2016, who was the first Iranian to pre present both uh, internationally in the United States and in Iran at the same time, as soon as he finished that mural, you know, certain restrictions were put on um, being able to come in and out of, of his respective country. So yes, there are, it has been quite hard. It's also, there have been certain states, uh, excuse me, certain um, restrictions from countries flying into the United States or from uh, certain countries allowing people from the United States to fly into their specific and respective countries. Um, so it is very hard. I think also uh, certain artists, even nationally, are having hard times wanting to not um, not not be in self-isolation, essentially, uh, for their other members of the family. A lot of the work we've done with upcoming programming is still using the power of Zoom, using the power of the phone call and the emails to still get projects done. Um, you know, in many cases within public art projects, it's not the artist solely working alone in the studio, they're working with fabricators, they're working with engineers. And so that work, you know, is not in one central hub. So I think public artists are also very used to working in that way. And that's actually been very helpful, I think, on our end, especially at the Greenway, is being able to work still in that way. That hasn't really changed for us, except for the fact of artists not being able to come specifically to see their work installed or specifically for a celebration at the end or public engagement. Does anyone else have anything they'd like to respond to that one? No? OK. Um, let's see. Uh, for uh, Kara, is the, this is specifically directed to you. Is there an exact date that the emancipation statue is slated to be removed? Uh, not yet. We had to go through our wonderful city procurement um, to take next steps on that. And there are other things that the Art Commission has asked for, like doing a 3D scan of the artwork. Um, so there are just some things we have to work through, but, um, but it will come down at some point, probably and, in the future. And one more follow-up question that relates to that. Um, is there a place to find data about the breakdown of representation in monuments, memorials in Boston or Massachusetts? And I guess maybe this is for all of us uh, because it's not just Boston related. Yeah, for Boston, I can say this is actually something that we're working on right now. So um, we are in the process of setting up a brand new first time ever public art database that will collect information like that about all of the public art, um, at least in the city's collection. And we'd like to expand it to um, privately owned public art as well. 
so that we can actually have something like that and you can do that kind of research and we can use that to inform future commissions. Thank you. Um, and Mione, this one's actually directed specifically to you as well too. Um, uh, excuse me. Um, I just lost my place in where this is. Uh, aside from murals, um, can any of you, particularly uh, Dr. Leone, see a place in academia for street art like wheat pasting, which inherently is non-permanent? Sure. Yeah, I think I'm I'm particularly interested in in temporary public art, and I love um, instances where art is an intervention in kind of a, a daily life or in a normal way of doing things. And I think weed pasting in particular can can do that in a way that's that's quick and cheap, but very impactful um, due to the graphic nature of it and whether it's text based or image based. I think it's a very um, uniquely suitable um, method of, of making public art in terms of having impact and being responsive to a particular current moment, so. Yeah, and I think that's also the beauty of public, of temporary works, you know, like we do on the Greenway too, is that it can be very reactionary and it can change with the conversations that are happening globally. Um, uh, I know we're running a little bit over, so I just wanna be respectful of time. I'm gonna uh, pull up one more question uh, and, and any of the questions that we may not have been able to answer, I will work to address and maybe put through a blog on the website as well too, just so we make sure we get to everyone's questions. But we have someone joining us from Toronto, Canada today uh, uh, yeah, by the name of Chloe Catan. And uh, she states, um, we planned uh, 2021 as our year of public art. Um, much like I think the city of Chicago did a couple of year, years ago as well too. Although COVID is creating all sorts of challenges around programming and logistics, the city is very much looking at this initiative in terms of economic recovery, much like the FDR, FDR did with the public uh, works program uh, after the Great Depression. Is Boston or the US or other cities that we know of looking at public art in these terms? Uh, although we, understanding large gatherings are not allowed, it's one of the only art forms right now that can be enjoyed safely outdoors. Does, does anyone have any thoughts on that? Um, sure, yeah, we've been, I think that we've been thinking about all of our paid opportunities for artists and like having more and more of those, um, maybe even in smaller pieces as a way of trying to fund artists kind of WPA style. But I do think something that's important to think about is particularly as we're hopefully having some more stimulus funding coming coming our way. Um, you know, how do we mobilize the funds that aren't already slated for art support to create jobs for artists? Um, if we really want to think about about the WPA as, a, as an inspiration. And so I think that's just uh, something to plant a seed that, you know, we're also thinking about, which is when there's money for health, for community engagement, for all of these other areas, like what are the ways in which there are opportunities to pay artists to be a part of that? So we're, we're kind of growing the pot and growing the understanding of how the arts can further all of our work. Um, but yes, we will be doing a big mural push also this summer as, as a way to create more paid opportunities. And just right before I, oh, Shay, were you gonna say something? I was just gonna say one quick thing just to piggyback off something Kara said. I think that it's imperative for all of us as people that work in the arts to really embed the idea that the arts aren't just part of health or education or public works. The arts are health and education and public works, right? It's not something that's adjacent that you can do a wave of and then still have health and public works going on. Like, no, 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 without the art community engaged in it, what you're doing is incorrect. And so that needs to be a big part of all of our work of making sure that people get that, right? Like the arts help mental health. It's not just about having doctors or nurses or, you know, physicians assistants who are amazing, but also artists can also give you some sense of clarity, levity, whatever the case may be to help some of the things that may be ailing you. So just wanted to throw that last bit in there. Thank you. And just to finalize one question, somebody asked, where can we see some great murals? I'm gonna recommend a couple, uh, Worcester, uh, go out to Worcester, see some amazing murals in Worcester. Go out to Salem, go see the Punto Urban Arts Museum. Amazing, amazing work out there. Go to Beyond Walls in Lynn. Lynn has some amazing work going on there. I believe there's some new work that has gone up in and around Boston in regards to um, uh, 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 sea level change uh, works as well too. The Rose Kennedy Greenway has some great murals. Uh, there's murals everywhere. Now and there has some amazing murals up as well too. Uh, you just got to search, but uh, those are some really good recommendations. So thank you so much. So uh, as I kind of close out first, I just want to say a massive thank you 
uh, uh, to all of you for having this conversation, being part of this conversation. I know we barely touched on a lot of these hard issues, but thank you so much for your comments. And also thank you so much for being part of the Greenland Public Art Advisory Group. You help in more ways than you know. So thank you so much to that, to, to Cara, to Che, to, to, to Leone, and to the rest of our Greenland Public Art Advisory Group members. Um, uh, and I'd also just like to thank, we do have a public official who's actually joining us today. I'd like to do a shout out to Senator, uh, to Councillor Ed Flynn, who is here. Um, so thank you so much for joining us, uh, uh, Councillor. Um, and I just want to pull up this last slide um, before we kind of close out. So, you know, this, this is a slide of, of kind of graffiti that happened in, um, excuse me, I believe it was uh, uh, Tokyo. Um, that basically says we can't return to normal because the normal that we had was the problem in the first place, right? And I think that this is uh, one of the, a, a very strong term and very strong, strong sentence because it, it not only relates to, I think, some of the ways in which we were practicing um, uh, the arts, uh, but more specifically, uh, how uh, the systemic racism, the way in which we treat people is so important, right? And so this concept of the quote unquote new normal may not exist, but something new is coming, right? And this is just something to remind us all of that. So uh, if we weren't able, as I stated, to address your question, uh, please feel free to email us uh, at info at rosekennedygreenway.org and we'll use these as inspirations for a blog post. Um, and we have been collecting your questions that they've been coming in. So if you posted them already, don't worry. Um, and you can also follow us on social media accounts to learn more about our public art programs and everything else we have to offer. I'd also encourage you to follow our panelists uh, at the city of Boston, uh, at Emerson Arts, at uh, Worcester, as well as their personal accounts because they're amazing accounts. Um, and I also just wanted to state, we have an upcoming webinar that's gonna be taking place um, as part of our series of webinars um, in, uh, that go into next spring. Uh, so join us on January 28th uh, for another public art webinar uh, titled Curating the Chinese Zodiac, uh, the work of Furan Dai and Andy Lee on the Rose Kennedy Greenway. Uh, you'll see a link being dropped in for an event bright for that as well too. And, you know, I mean, in these challenging times, uh, we, we have, can't be remiss about talking about this as well too, that the Greenway Conservancy remains committed uh, to providing you with a world-class public park. Um, you know, there are, we are so grateful to our Greenway community, uh, from our board members and our staff, to our volunteers, to our donors and our political officials at the same time. And as so many of you are, we are preparing to, uh, for significant um, challenges, financial challenges ahead. So, um, you know, our earned income, which typically makes up a third of our annual budget, will be lower than last year by $1.25 million due to lower rent from our food trucks and delayed openings of the carousel and the beer gardens. Uh, and in 2020, we also had to cancel our biggest fundraising event of the year, our June Gala on the Greenway, which will be going virtual this year, just so everyone knows. Um, and we did receive wonderful PPP funding, but we still have to make significant budget uh, reductions this year. And while we are thrilled that vaccines are on the way, uh, we know that 2021 will, be con will continue to be challenging from both financial and oper operational standpoints. And since so most of our annual budget comes from private sources, support for the Conservancy is sorely needed in order to continue to provide the community with a safe and beautiful haven, as well as public art, uh, which is completely uh, privately fundraised for. So we appreciate our family supporters more than ever at this time. And you can always help the Greenway by making a donation and joining our volunteer program, which you'll see links in uh, as well posted in our chat. And with that, thank you again to our speakers. Um, please be safe out there and have a wonderful holiday uh, 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 season. Happy Hanukkah, uh, everyone as well too. Uh, and with that, we hope you see it, we see you on the Greenway. So thank you again and enjoy the day, everyone.